Welcome to Reveal Community Church. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook to get the latest updates. Now enjoy this message as we discover what it means to really live. Bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Fear not. I'm going to start out this Christmas season by um, saying that verse today because it's an amazing thing that God knew who each of us was and what we struggle with. You know, if you read the Old Testament, if you're like me and you go back and read things, people back then were really afraid of God. They didn't have a good knowledge, understanding, comprehension of the goodness of God. Now, I am not going to stand in front of you today and tell you that I understand all of this. I I read a story um, this week, and it's in the book of Joshua. And I've heard people preach on it. And it was about a guy who um, hid some stuff in his tent, and the Lord told them to search out whoever it was because Israel was being defeated in battle. And they searched him out, and it was like God drilled it down to whoever this was, and they found him, found what he had in his tent, and they took he and his family and destroyed them. Now, do I understand how that works with a good God? I know there's some covenant things that were happening at that time. I am so excited, though, to get to heaven and ask those questions, because I know that God is not opposing of himself, that he does not ever behave one way to one person and another way to another. He's not good one day and bad the other. He's not a God that should be feared. Now, the Bible says that we are to reverence him. To fear the Lord means to reverence. That's what the word should be translated. It's, not, it's like looking up to somebody that you really um, think is, is amazing and awesome. That's reverence. But fear is something totally different. And if we look at God out of fear, it motivates us in a whole different way. It makes us want to clean ourselves up on the outside. You know, Jesus called the scribes and the Pharisees whitewashed brood of vipers. And I think it's amazing he said whitewashed because that means that they painted themselves to look good on the outside. I don't know about any of the rest of you in here if this has ever happened to you in church, but I think that is something that the church um, has to be so aware of. That we come together with each other and we put on our whitewash. We make ourselves look good. We make ourselves appear that everything's okay. Because that's what we're supposed to do. And we live in a society today. Now, come on, all the guys in here especially know this. If you show a weakness... If you show any form of weakness, you're looked down on. Right? Come on, how many of you in high school, in gym class, if you let one person see how weak you were, what happened? You were the guy that got pelted up against the sides of the lockers. And and I can I I was just sharing this with my wife and Kim last week and telling this because I actually lived the life of the what was the, the movie? The oh, Diary of the Wimpy Kid. I lived that when I was in high school. Randy went to the same high school I was at. He knows. I was 100 pounds and 6 foot 2 when I was in 6th grade. So I was this big around, and I was this sensitive music kid. So put all that together, Brian's laughing. I lived a swirly. Does everybody know what a swirly is? Uh Uh-huh. You guys know what a swirly is? I got turned upside down and my head dunked in the toilet and they flushed it with my head in the toilet. Where are they? Thanks, Luann. (laughs) But if you showed any weakness, if you showed weakness, it was just something that Everybody, it was like a dog. They could sense it. 
I got this. And, and everybody closed in and surrounded. Weakness was not something that you display. But let me read to you, and if you guys want to turn here with me, it's 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Second Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches in needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is Paul that wrote that. This goes so contrary to everything that we have learned in our society, in our culture, is we don't show weakness. You don't show that something is going on with you. You put your whitewash on and you display that everything's just fine. But this says right here that my strength is made perfect in weakness. I want to talk to you guys today some about this. Last week, we talked about the three guys that were in the fiery furnace and that Jesus showed up right there in their weakness. When we, and this is the best way I can say this, is acknowledge to him we're weak. That's where he can be strong. But if we put on a show for everybody around us, all at once that show becomes something we put on for God as well. And when, the more we put on a show, we start making it about the things that we do. And the more we make it about the things that we do, the more we start fearing God. That sounds like a funny connection, but I wanted you to hear it that way this morning. Because God said, came that you would not be afraid of him. Jesus came to the earth that fear would be done away with. That we could say, I'm weak, and he can be strong inside of me. Let's see if I get into this this morning and can explain this a little bit. I want you guys to turn with me to Proverbs 4.23. It's very quiet in here. Ah, that's, that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Keep, and another translation says guard, protect, this part of you called your heart. And, and that's what we looked at last week was this middle part of you, your soul, your heart, your mind, your will, and your emotions. You're to guard it, to keep it, and protect it because out of it flow. And these are funny old words here, but I'm going to see if I can explain this to you a little bit. If any of you have ever heard this before, the words issues of life spring the issues of life. The word issues actually is translated borders or boundaries. It's how big your life will become. It's what you will let into your life and what you will let out. Does that make sense? So it springs out of that place inside of you called your soul. Now, I'm gonna, if you guys want to turn here, you can. I'm going to quote this verse. It's, it's John, 3 John 1, 2 says, I pray that it may go well with you that you may prosper and be in your health even as your soul prospers. This part of you called your soul, it has to do with everything in your life going well for you if your soul prospers, if this part of you, your mind, your will, and your emotions, if it's going well with you, that part of you. And the word prospers means to go well. Don't get hung up on prosperity means, oh, that you're going to have money and you're going to have riches. It just means that it's going well with you. But your life will go well, and it totally correlates to this part inside of you that Proverbs says you're supposed to keep and protect. How do you keep and protect your heart? Well, last week we talked a little bit about those little foxes that come in to dig out, that come in to root in and and destroy and hollow out that part of you to disconnect you from God. 
I'm going to say to you today that the place, the way that you keep your heart is by staying connected. But there's a lot of things in our life that try to pull us away and disconnect us from God. And there's a number one that I want to share about today, and I'm kind of jumping around here, but that I want to share about today. And it's this little word that we use in church again called sin. Now, I could stand up here today and I could talk to you about this word sin. Every one of us, when the word sin comes up, I don't know if, if it affects you this way, but when somebody starts talking sin, it starts relating back to that fear of God. That, I don't know, God must be harsh because he, he's telling me I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Do you know it says in James that knowing what's right to do and not doing it is a sin? It's not just knowing what's wrong to do and, and keeping yourself free from that. It's knowing what's right to do and not doing it. That's a sin. Well, this little word sin means literally to be separated. So to be disconnected from God. And to keep our heart, we have to keep ourselves free from sin. Okay, now this sounds like a lot of works again, Larry. Well, that's what I want to explain to you today. Because... The church for a long time has had this understanding that the way you keep your heart is that you follow rules. I got real quiet and everybody in here got quiet again. Isn't that what this is full of? Is a bunch of rules, a bunch of laws, a bunch of do it this way, do it that way, do it this way, and then your life will be good. Isn't that what that, that thing means? That if you... Um, your soul will prosper even, your life will prosper even as your soul prospers. If I follow all the rules just right, if I do it just right, then everything will go good with me. No. See, what it's talking about is what's inside of your heart flowing out. We work out our salvation. What's inside of us works out to affect every area of our life. It's not the other way around. You don't whitewash yourself and then make ourselves look good on the outside and then it affects the inside. It does not work that way. I've met people and honestly, I've lived that way myself. You can put on a really good show on the outside and be hurting on the inside. A lot of churches and, and we can have people here today because you walk in with hurts in your life. This is a real world we live in. There are things that happen to each one of us through the week that we deal with in our jobs, with other people, with family. And this is really pertinent right now with the holidays coming up because, you know, as much as we'd love to be with family, you know who the greatest hurts in life happen through? is family. So we live in an imperfect world where sin and things happen. If we try to clean ourselves up on the outside and the inside is affected, what does that make us? Just a hollow shell. We can look pretty, but the power of God is not at work on the inside of us. You know, the Bible talks about having a semblance of godliness, but no power thereof. It's people that clean themselves up on the outside, can follow all the rules or pretend, come on, we can pretend we follow the rules really well. You know how to, to skirt around things. And, and this is the other thing when we're kids, we're taught to, to not get caught. If I can just do all these little things and slide by and not get caught, then I'm good. I'm golden. I didn't, if I didn't get caught, then I didn't break a rule, right? <laughs> but it's not about the rules. It's about what's on the inside. And this part of our, of our being, that's the only way I can say this, is our spirit man is born again. Our flesh fights against God. And we have this middle person, our soul, that has pulled both directions. But when our soul is connected with God, I mean, there's just these amazing things that happen. There's these amazing things that happen. You know, when your soul is connected with God, you feel refreshed, revived, renewed, re-energized, reinvigorated, on fire. But when you're drained, now come on, we're just being real here. When you have a week 
at work that just drains you completely. Do you feel those things? Do you feel that, that draining, that pulling out of everything that's on the inside of you? And then you're trying to get back to where you want to be. That's your soul. There's a, there's a going out of that overflow that's on the inside of you. But it's got to be filled back up again with the connection with God. If you're disconnected with him, if you try it, now here's the words I'm going to use, if you try to do it on your own. Do you know one of the, the greatest sins we can say is, I've got this. I got this. Lord, I'm good. The Bible just told us when we read in 2 Corinthians, or, yeah, in 2 Corinthians that, that in my strength is made perfect in weakness. That his strength comes into being, into fulfillment through our weakness. But if we don't acknowledge that, if we, don't, if we just say, I'm good, I got this, put on my show, put on my church face, I'm good, then how is God's strength ever going to move through you? Do you know this weakness word means an inability or an incapacity to do it on your own? But the word strength, I want you to hear this. There's a whole bunch of scriptures in the New Testament I could quote that have this very same word in it. It's called dunamos. It's where we get the word dynamite. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the word power, same word, exceedingly abundantly above all that we hope or think or ask for according to the mighty power that works in you. That's Ephesians. Same word. I could quote over and over and over the words that talk about this word strength or power. But really the root of it is beyond yourself. It's a miraculous beyond human capacity. Miraculous. Miracle working. Something only God can do. So when we stand up and say, I got this. I got my whitewash on. We are actually denying a miracle to happen in our life. Do you know the Bible tells us that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel and that these signs shall follow those that believe? Those signs are miracles. The miracles start not because you go out and I pray over this guy and the whole the whole city hears that this guy was raised up and that's a sign and miracle. No, a sign and a miracle is that Connor is having a real struggle in his life and he leans on God and God does something miraculous and people see him living that miracle out. I'm going to smack you on the forehead one more time. <laughs> I don't know if I can say it again, but, but see, we think miracles are something that we're not involved with. Um, Cindy and, and Brenda and I and a few others, Luann knows him too, is there's a guy named Jeff Comstock that we know, and Jeff is going over to Africa. Jeff goes over and holds miracle services. And it's amazing to me that you go to Africa, and he lays hands on little kids that, you know, might have a deformed leg, and they're healed. Yeah. He's seen legs grow out, club feet restored, eyes opened, ears opened. The guy lives just, uh, I don't know, an hour away from us. Is he any different than you and I or anyone in here? No. And you know what's funny? He comes back to Iowa, and those things don't very seldom happen. Because we have learned how to whitewash ourselves and make us look like we're good on the outside and we don't need, God, I'm good. I'm good, I don't need, I'm good. Come on, we do. People that are in extreme need and somebody comes with some hope in front of them and says, hey, if I can just pray for you, they put all their expectation and everything that's inside of them is laid right out there. They have no front in front of them that holds God away from working in their life. That's it. That's right. That's it. But we put on such a good show. And really the show is doing nothing. 
The power of God does not come through the show. The power of God comes, and what does it say? Through our weakness. Not being afraid to let our weakness be shown, be seen. Now, here's another word I want to use today because the, and I'm not going to turn here, is the Bible says to humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and in due season he will lift you up. The word humble, I think the church here today, and we'll go back to me in high school, um, the word humble does not mean humiliate. But that's what we've got a picture of. That to humble ourselves means to be humiliated. To humble ourselves and say, I'm weak, means all at once, I'm fair game for everybody that wants to dip me into the toilet or slam me up against the, the lockers or knock my books out of my arm. My glasses sailed down the hallway I don't know how many times when I was in high school. And I wore the great big black ones before they were cool. <laughs> But humble does not mean humiliate. But we're fearful. We're a fearful people because we think if we show our weakness, if we put ourselves out there and say, I can't do this, then we're in a position to be humiliated. We think that that's what God wants to do. Can I show you different than that? Can you guys turn to to John 8, 2? This is going to be a very familiar story, but I want to read this to you, and then I want to share some things with you. John chapter 8, verse 2. Now, early in the morning, he came again to the temple. This was Jesus, came into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in in the midst. I'm going to stop there and we'll come back and finish that story in just a minute. But you guys have probably heard this story before. I just have to, to paint this picture about it, I guess, to start, because this is a wild picture for me to get. These church guys, that's who they were, the scribes and the Pharisees. They were the pastors, the associate pastors, the elders, you know, the leaders in the church. These church guys, they brought this woman in, and they caught her. Now, I, gotta, I don't know, if, am I the only one that thinks about stuff like this when I read the Bible, but, but when you read this, it's like, how did they catch her? What, what happened to lead up to this place? Was there gossiping going on? Were people talking behind this woman's back and saying, you should watch who she's hanging out with? Was there some setup here? Was there some undercurrent that we don't know? I mean, come on, these are the church leaders. They had to follow this woman to, or follow the guy that she was with. They follow them and they catch her getting, and I'm just gonna say it this way, catch her getting cozy with this guy and they walk in and they grab her. This was not something that happened on the street, come on. This was some guys, and this is the words I'm going to use, were searching out sin. They were sin chasers. (laughs) It's it's a weird picture, isn't it? To think that they they saw it as their duty, as the, the leaders of the church, to snuff out everything that was bad and to make sure that it didn't infect everybody else. See, they were trying to find 
weaknesses. Now, I'm going to use that interchangeably today with the word sin. Because every one of you in here, I don't care who you are, what your background is, where you've come from, what you're doing in your life right now, there are things that you struggle with. Come on. You're a real human being. There's things that you struggle with. And I'm not going to get off on, I've said this a couple weeks, teaching about the nature of sin. But our flesh pulls against God. Our flesh speaks to us every day. My flesh talks to me all the time about things that I want to have that I shouldn't have. Come on, it does. (laughs) We have, and these are the words I'm going to use, evil tendencies. Every one of us does. We fight it. There's a battle in our soul for what we think about, what we will let ourselves feel, and what the choices we'll make. There's a battle going on. Well, we have evil tendencies, and can I use this interchangeably? Weaknesses. Sin. So these people were trying to find the weaknesses. And here's the thing. They weren't looking at themselves. They were trying to find it in somebody else. I want to say something to you today. It might sound a little funny, but when we become insensitive to God's voice inside of us, when we are desensitized when we're missing what he's speaking, and this is a word I'll use, is convicting us of those evil tendencies in our own life. When we shut that off and say, I'm good. I got it, God. When we shut that off, what happens is we start looking and finding fault in other people around us. We start becoming sin chasers like these guys instead of Jesus chasers, instead of God chasers. That's a sign for you, I want to say to you today. If you start seeing weaknesses and sin in somebody else, you need to examine your own heart because God is probably speaking to you about something. A little silly illustration, but anytime you do this, there's three of them pointing right back at you. (laughs) Yeah, but Larry, doesn't it say in the Bible that if we see a brother sinning, we're supposed to go to him and fix it, right? Does it, you guys? What it says, and you can turn here if you want to, is Galatians 6.1. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, sin, weakness, fault, You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Oh, there's a big word here that we miss. Restore. See, your job as a believer is not to go point out sin. Stephen, I see this in your life. You just really need to get this fixed, buddy. If you don't get this fixed. You know, is that what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to go, now here's, here's the other thing. It says if you see a brother. Is this somebody that is a, an acquaintance with you, that you've met a few times, that you see at church sitting across the way and you go, well, I've heard about Cindy. <laughs> is that who it's supposed to be? A brother means somebody that you are in a close, tight relationship with, that you have the ability to share something in a very loving way that they can receive because this says to do it in a spirit of gentleness with the idea of restoring them this isn't the idea of pointing out somebody's sin pointing out their weakness humiliating them this is the idea of hey i see something in your life that might hurt you and i see some things that i want to share with you because i want god's best for you 
I want him to be doing everything he possibly can do in your life to propel you forward in all he has for you. You know, that's a different thing than pointing out somebody's fault. The body of Christ has kind of taken it upon themselves that, that we're each other's Holy Spirit. Come on. I'm not Friday's Holy Spirit. I don't get to tell her what's right and wrong in her life. Even as her pastor, I don't, get, I don't, I don't have that right. I can share, these are the things, Friday, I see over you. I see God doing these things in your life, and I can share some things. I see if you, if you would change this, that God can really move you forward. But I have to do that out of a heart of love. If I don't have love for her, if you go back and read the, the chapter in Corinthians, chapter 13, I'm just, I'm just a noise. And that person is not going to receive it. And there's one more thing I want to share about this verse, and then I, I kind of got off on a segue here, but it says, lest you should be tempted. You know, the other misunderstanding about that verse is we think that if we get around somebody that they've got sin in their life, that it's contagious. If I sit too close to Kayla, I'm going to catch whatever that thing is that's going on in her. That's not what that means. Do you know what that literally means? Is, is that if you point to somebody else and find fault in them, and don't walk in love to them, you've opened the door and given the enemy a right to move in your life and tempt you. It has nothing to do with what's going on inside that person. It has everything to do with how you do it from your heart. Because you give the enemy rights. He's searching, seeking whom he may devour. If you let him have that right, he's going to take it. He's going to tempt you. You guys know that, that sin is from the enemy. He's the author, the father of sin. And sin comes when we are tempted. And the Bible tells us who is the father of temptation. Who tempts us? It's the devil. This is not something that you have within yourself. Yes, you have a nature that is pulled towards that. But the enemy is the one that tempts i got to get back on track here. So, these guys. These religious guys were trying to show themselves as superior to this lady. Come on. There was something working inside of them and something works inside of each one of us when we start pointing a finger at somebody else. And it's a word we don't like to hear about, but it's called pride. Because it's, I'm better than you. I'm more spiritual than you. I know better than you. I've got this down, you don't. They were bringing her to Jesus to say, you know, this is what the law demands. Okay, now we're going to see what you do with it. They were testing him because Jesus had this message of love. And they had what the rule was. So what did Jesus do? So if I had a pile of sand up here, I would take my finger and show you because as he, as he was listening to them, he starts writing in the sand. And it's like, did he hear them? Well, yeah, he heard what they said, but he's writing in the sand. And he keeps writing, and they're like, well, come on, Jesus, we asked you this. What are you going to do? What do you think she, she deserves? Doesn't she deserve to be punished? Doesn't she deserve what the law says? And Jesus looks up at him and then looks back down and keeps writing and says, the first one of you that's without sin, throw the, throw the stone. And he keeps writing. Now, can I ask you guys to turn back there to John 8? It's verse 7. I'm going to read it one more time. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then 
those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience. Let me pause there just a second. They heard it. They heard what? What Jesus said, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. That's what I always heard. They heard it. They heard. The word heard doesn't mean that you heard it with your ear. It means that you understand and comprehend and got something in your heart. So what was Jesus writing? Because he wasn't squiggle doodling. I'm a doodler. Every time I sit in a meeting at work, I've got a whole page of doodles because that's just what my hand does while I'm sitting there trying to listen to everything that's going on or trying to block it out. And was he just blocking them out and doodling in the sand? It says that he wrote. What was he writing? I want to present to you today because this is really important to understand about who Jesus is. Because I always thought, and I think I've even taught this, that Jesus was writing their sins in the sand. Because it says there was an order that they left right after hit, that, that their conscience was convicted, and they left one by one, the oldest to the, the youngest. Did Jesus know that about them? Well, he did supernaturally. But all these guys show up. You know, we've got the bearded guys with the robes on and who can tell how old which one is but they left oldest to youngest he knew specific information about each one of them the same way as he knows specific information about you so was he writing their sins could he write well um all you guys are standing here and well here's the lady you've been with and here's the lady you've been with. you know is that what he was writing the problem with that picture, you guys, is that that says that he remembered their sin. What does the Bible tell us about our sin? That all of our sin was paid for by the blood of Jesus. When he gave his life on the cross, every sin that we ever commit or ever will is already paid for. Now here's the rest. And he forgets it. He throws it as far as the east is from the west. He doesn't remember it any longer. So what was he writing? You know what I think he was writing? I think he was writing the things that God had done in each of their lives. The Bible says that men are pulled towards repentance by the goodness of God. Yeah. Not by the sins that they've committed. Not by pointing out their wrong. Not by telling them, you need to change. You're going to hell if you don't. That is not God's nature. I don't care what you read in the Old Testament. I thought about this story today. I don't understand. Here's another one I don't understand is Ananias and Sapphira. You guys know that story? That, that they show up and the husband shows up and, and he lies and it says he lies to the Holy Spirit. And he falls down dead in church. That's quite the church service. <laughs> and his wife hadn't got there yet. She was late. You know, must have overslept or had something going on with the kids. And she shows up 15 minutes later. And she's like, where's my husband? Well, come up here, honey. And she comes up to the front of the church. And they say, so tell us about. And she lies too. And she's out. She's gone. She's dead. Did God do that? See, it doesn't fit with the character and nature of who I know God is. I'm looking forward to that day when I get to heaven and I can rectify that. But what I do know is he is good. And the Bible says that he calls us to repentance by his goodness. By his mercy. His mercies are new every morning. They never fail us. So if I know that, then I have to filter, sorry, I took your word again, have to filter that, everything I read from the place that God is good and he loves me. Right. If I don't filter that, I start becoming afraid of who God is. Afraid that if I take down my wall, take down my whitewash, and really let him see my weaknesses, that I'm going to be in trouble. He's going to see who I really am, and he's not going to want me. 
it kind of goes along with you guys. I don't know. If one of you in here today walk out of church and you have lunch with somebody that you know and they have really messed up their life and they say, I don't know how to, I, I, I'm, I'm a believer, I know Jesus, but I, I, I'm in such a mess, I don't know what to do. I've really made this huge mess in my life. I've got all these sins that are waiting down on me. What do I do? Well, if you're like me, you probably go, okay, there's four steps. First one is that you need to be really sorry. Okay, and then if you're really sorry, then you need to confess it, and that's what you're doing right now. You're telling me about it, right? And then the third one is you need to say, God, please forgive me. And the fourth one is tell him you're never going to do it again. Have you ever heard anything like that? That that's how we have made forgiveness of sin that we, mistakes that we make, sin that we get involved with, weaknesses that we don't want to admit, that we have to go through these works, step, 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 and then God can forgive me. I heard somebody say this a long time ago too, that, that I just am praying that God will show me if I have any unconfessed sin because it's going to hold me back. Is that true? Well, you guys, I'm going to take you here and then we're going to wrap this today. Can you turn to 1 John 1.9? 1 John 1.9. This is that verse, right? This is the four-step verse. Everybody says we're, we're grateful it's in, in the Bible, you know, I'm, I'm so excited that it's there because that means that, that I have a way back to God if I fall. Let me read it to you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me read it again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You know, this was written to believers, Right? This was not written to people who didn't know who Jesus is. This is not saying the same thing as, as you come to meet Jesus and accept him as your Lord and Savior by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. But it has that same word in there, confess. I want to tell you why that word is so important in this verse. Because the word confess means to agree with what's already been done. This does not say that I need to get down on my knees. Oh God, I'm so sorry. That's what we have turned the doctrine into though in the church. Now I'm not telling you we shouldn't be sorry. That we shouldn't have godly sorrow if we did something we know is wrong. Because there's a washing and a cleansing that happens. But it does not tell us to get down on our knees and whine and snivel and cry and bawl when we have made a mistake when we're letting our weakness be shown. It says to agree with what's already been done. And then it goes on to say, and he is faithful and just to forgive. Do you know the word forgive? The best way I can say this to you is remember the song from Frozen. Let it go. That's the best way that you can relate to forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean that if I don't confess this, then there's a wall between me and God, that I'm not going to go to heaven because I didn't confess that one little thing that I did wrong, that weakness, that falling, that shortcoming, that, that failing. It does not mean that. When you were born again, something new was recreated on the inside of you. I'm kind of revealing to you my stance on something here is that I believe once that, that part of you is born again, you can't lose that. And you don't need to go to the altar every time you come to church to get it again because you fell, you made a mistake. See, if that is true, that that part of you became new again, how can it die and be born again and die and be born again and die? It doesn't work that way. That part of you became brand new. It stays new. But the enemy wants to deceive you and say, hey, you, you made that mistake. You fell. 
Iva, look at what you said this week. God can't, God can't accept you anymore. Isn't that the kind of lies he brings to us all the time? He tries to deceive us and say that our sins, and they do, they put a block between us and God. But it's not God moving, it's us moving. It pulls us away from him. So here, it's really important to understand that it's not a coming and confessing your sin so that I'm, I'm, I'm saved again, I'm born again, again. It's a clearing the slate to get the junk that's in between you and God away. Let it go means he's pushing it away from you. So it will not hinder the connection you have with him. And there's one last piece of the word, verse then. It says, cleanses us. I have to say it this way because I don't know how to explain it any different is I got to go back and, and I used um, lepers in a message just recently, but that's the best way to explain what this is because back in the Bible time, um, there were people that suffered from this disease called leprosy. And leprosy, um, it dulled the senses in their fingers, their toes, their face, any part of their body. It killed the nerve endings. So they were desensitized and they could get damaged then. You know, they could smack their hand against a wall and, and split their finger open and not even feel it. You know, it caused this, and we would say it this way, deformities to happen to these people because you know, they could lose a nose or an ear because they got an infection and, and it wouldn't heal because the nerve endings, it, it was just a nasty, nasty disease. It made them, this is the way the society looked at them, they treated them like freaks. Like, you know, they, they were outcasts. Sin inside of our lives, in our soul, in that inner part of us is where it affects it affects us the same way as leprosy affects those people. It desensitizes us to being connected with God. It, how can I say this any clearer? Um, that disease was eating away at them and sin eats away at the inside of us. And this word cleanse is the word that was used when a leper was healed, they had to go show themselves to the high priest. And when they showed themselves to the high priest, the high priest literally had to shout, take my mic away here, clean! And the lepers before that time, they had to go through the street and say unclean, unclean, wherever they went, they had to shout that. But when the high priest examined them and they were clean, he began to shout before them that this was a, this was a change. This was something that, that they were totally different. Now they were accepted. You know who our high priest is today? Jesus. When we go and agree with what he's already done, and he pushes that sin away from us, he shouts at the top of his lungs, clean! And it's a declaration to the world around and to the enemy. You cannot torment them anymore. They are clean. I want to go back to John 8.10 one last time. John 8, verse 10. So the guys, the religious guys, left one by one in our story. And it was because I believe that Jesus was writing the things that God had done for them. And, you know, there were several things, I think, that happened that day. You can't get close to God without his presence affecting you. These guys were standing in the presence of the Son of God. He was writing stuff that God had done in their life, and all at once their heart was pricked. They were convicted of what was happening in their own life. And one by one, they left. And who was left standing that day was there was this 
woman who they brought and accused. The one they went chasing to catch her in her weakness and sin. And she's standing there with Jesus. And let's read this, what Jesus said. When Jesus himself, or had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. He didn't tell her to go and sin no more first, and then I I won't condemn you. Clean yourself up. Get your act together, woman. Then I accept you. He said, first of all, know this. I don't condemn you. That's what he's telling each one of you today. Condemnation is not from God. Conviction, a pricking of your heart in your soul is God speaking to you. That word conviction means so you can correct and make it right. Not to clean yourself up so you're accepted to him, but so that you can move forward in all the things God has for you. That sin won't hold you back. That's what conviction is for. But condemnation is a sentence. Condemnation is that you don't deserve to be near me. He didn't condemn her. And once she knew that, then she could go forward and sin no more. That is the very same thing for us today, you guys. When we're able to look at that and understand and comprehend and know that Jesus does not condemn us, then we can live the way he wants us to live. It's not the cleaning up on the outside. It's the taking care of the inside first. I want to go back one place and you don't have to turn there. As I started out with 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. There's a word here that I want to share. My grace is sufficient. What I'm preaching to you today is grace. Grace is something that we don't deserve but that God gives us. The Bible tells us that he will give us more and 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 more grace. It's never ending. He keeps extending what he's done for us. It doesn't cease. It doesn't say, well, if, if you fit these rules and guidelines, then my grace will be there. No, his grace never ceases. The Bible says sin shall not have dominion over you for we're not under the law, but under grace. But the word sufficient here is what I want to say to you, the last thing today. My grace is sufficient. It sounds like, well, it's enough. It's enough. It's it. It's all I need. Yes, it is. But the word sufficient means a barrier to ward off. See, your weaknesses, the enemy wants to magnify. Your weaknesses, he wants you to be tempted in them so they will turn into sin that will separate you and keep you away from God to break that connection in your soul. So your soul won't prosper. So you won't be able to keep and guard and protect what God's placed on the inside of you. But it says right here that my grace is, is sufficient. My grace is a barrier. My grace, my grace is to ward off the attack of the enemy. And how does that happen? It's when we take off the whitewash and we take off the outward and we say, God, I'm weak and I can't do it on my own. And we say, your strength is made perfect in weakness. So I receive what you have for me. It is so counterintuitive, you guys. It's like entering into his presence with singing. We come close to him because we sing. It's that we can tap into the strength of God by honestly acknowledging I'm weak. Not by standing up, I got this God. I got my outside looking clean, I'm good. It's by honestly saying to him, I need you. I need you. That's where his grace becomes sufficient. 
I'm going to share more next week, I hope, about grace. But could you guys all stand with me? Jesus, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are not a God who humiliates. That you don't point out our weaknesses, our shortcomings, our sins. That conviction, Lord Jesus, comes inside of each one of us. So, Father, we just pray that you would make our hearts sensitive to you. Make our hearts sensitive to you. Let our hearts be so connected with you, Lord, that nothing, nothing stands in the way. And I pray for the power that you promised to pour out in each of our lives. I pray for that power, Lord Jesus, to work inside of, of each and every person here, that in their weakness, that power, that power will be seen, Lord Jesus. That power will be displayed. The miraculous, wonder-working power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that it will be a testimony and a light and a witness to the people around us. That we're not, we're not afraid of God. We're not afraid to let our weaknesses be shown. But we're willing to put ourselves out there because we have such a trust and a knowing that you are good. So Lord Jesus, let that goodness just flood each person here right now. Let your goodness and your mercy overflow in our lives. And Father, give us a revelation of your grace, of what we don't deserve, of the favor that you have for us, of the never-ending, never-ceasing pouring out of your goodness in our life, even when we don't deserve it. Jesus, just work mightily in our lives. We just yield ourselves to you today. We pull down those whitewashed walls, Lord Jesus, and let you really see who we are in our heart. And we ask you to change us. So work in our hearts, Lord Jesus. In your mighty name.